1974, Sir John Kerr was appointed Governor General on the recommendation of Mr. Whitlam, who spoke of Sir John's significant achievements in law and administration. But then the trouble started for the government. In 1975, Dr. Cairns was sacked from the post of Deputy Prime Minister because of Australia's loan-raising activities overseas. And Dr. Cairns complained, but Mr. Whitlam defended the dismissal. There was no option for any Prime Minister in such a matter. No Prime Minister can have a minister uh, against whom it can be said that he has misled the Parliament. But for the Whitlam government, the loans affair would not go away. Mr. Rex Connor, the Minister for Minerals and Energy, was forced to resign. Then the opposition leader, Mr. Fraser, decided to use his numbers in the Senate to block supply, to force a general election. Mr. Whitlam refused to call for a double dissolution. His government should stay in office because of its majority in the lower house. Neither leader would back down. So must Sir John Kerr accept your advice, whatever advice you give? Unquestionably. The Governor General takes the advice from his Prime Minister and from no one else. And must act on that advice? Unquestionably. The Governor General must act on the advice of his Prime Minister. There is no tolerance here, he must None do. None whatever. Then came Remembrance Day, November the 11th, 1975. After meetings with both leaders, the Governor General announced that he was dismissing Mr. Whitlam and appointing Mr. Fraser as caretaker Prime Minister until a general election decided the issue. An angry Mr. Whitlam responded to his sacking in a speech on the steps of Parliament House. Well, may we say, God save the Queen. Because nothing will save the Governor-General. The proclamation which you have just heard read by the Governor-General's official secretary was countersigned Malcolm Fraser. <laughs> Who will undoubtedly go down in Australian history from Remembrance Day 1975 as Kerr's Kerr. A bitter and sometimes violent campaign followed. But the election on December the 13th brought a crushing defeat for the ALP and for Mr Whitlam. There were challenges to his leadership, and in the most recent, Mr Hayden came within just a few votes of toppling the man who in 1972 brought Labour to government for the first time in 23 years. There was renewed hope for Mr Whitlam last month when the Prime Minister, Mr Fraser, called an early election. But by 10 o'clock on election night, the end was in sight. Half an hour later, Mr Whitlam conceded the inevitable. I congratulate the Liberal and National Country Parties on winning the elections and winning them convincingly. I want to thank all the Labor candidates and their supporters who put up an excellent campaign in every state and both territories. As soon as it's reasonably clear who are the Labor members of the new House of Representatives and the Senate, I shall call them together. Uh, to elect the executive. Uh, I myself will not be nominating for the position of leader. Have Thank you. Anything you. More to say, Mr. Whitman? No, he has nothing more to say. That is the only statement And so, with a brief and dignified statement, Mr. Whitlam turned his back on the leadership stakes and brought to an end what has been described as one of the most significant political careers in Australia's history. As a parliamentary opponent put it, no matter what you think of Gough Whitlam, all the things he did, he will always be remembered as a political giant, a man who has indelibly left his mark on Australia.